I'm sure introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Ruthie Gafari. He's a co-founder and CEO of Abacor Biosystems, a company developing a proprietary wearable microfluidic sensing platform. He also serves as an associate research professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Northwestern University and is the director of translational research at the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. Uh, Dr. Jafari received his PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the Harvard Medical School MIT program in Health Sciences and Technology. His research and translational contributions in wearable bioelectronics, microfluidic systems, and auditory neuroscience have been recognized with many awards. He has published over 100 academic papers and is inventor on over 60 issued patents. With that, uh, Dr. Roos uh, Gafari, we're very excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Cindy, and uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, to be here to present uh, to the worldwide audience uh, today. Um, I'm focusing today on uh, the various wearable systems um, that have integrated microfluidics and electrochemical sensing capabilities, um, and a lot of work, as um, Cindy mentioned, is uh, uh, being done at a commercial scale, but it all stems from research um, and development that was actually um, spawned out of uh, academia. So I'll uh, mention how and uh, ways that we take to translate uh, these technologies going forward. Uh, so for my talk today, I'm going to focus on the, the core technology, the, the wearable microfluidic and bioelectronic systems, uh, some of the field testing and trials that we run to help uh, prove out feasibility and uh, ultimately to get it to that next stage of translation, clinical validation, and scale up. Uh, and then I'll end with uh, some thoughts on future directions and where where things are going. Uh, but to start, um, we, we have all uh, experienced and lived over the past decade or so uh, this uh, convergence of uh, first and foremost biophysical sensing capabilities um, and more recently biochemical uh, sensing capabilities uh, enabling new classes of remote care. Um, so present day, if we sort of look across the consumer health as well as medical landscape, there's a number of various devices that uh, that have ECG, heart rate, uh, step counting, uh, respiration, and various other types of biometric uh, sensing capabilities. Um, where we see things going towards the future is this convergence of not only the biophysical uh, capabilities shown in these classes of devices uh, towards the bottom left, but also uh, biochemical sensing capabilities that could provide even more insight about metabolic health, um, hydration, as well as even um, quantitative ways of measuring stress levels. Um, and I, I've highlighted just a few different biomarkers, uh, electrolytes, hormones, as well as uh, metabolites shown here. Uh, and really the future is how do we bring these two uh, classes of technology together in a unified system? And the, the way that uh, we're looking at doing that is by first identifying the uh, the, the biofluid target. Um, there's a number of different uh, opportunities here, saliva, urine an analysis, as well as uh, more existing uh, blood and interstitial uh, fluid-based uh, targets. Um, what, what I'm going to focus on today uh, is around ecrine sweat um, being a a really interesting, rich uh, biofluid that uh, we, we're just beginning to understand. Uh, one of the key aspects of it, uh, why it's interesting, is uh, it's non-invasively uh, captured, harnessed uh, from your skin, and uh, that really opens up the ability to uh, make measurements um, without really being invasive. Um, and so I, I'm Focusing on that, I'll share some thoughts on how we could both uh, in an active mode as well as a passive mode, tap into sweat um, and, and be able to measure the various biomarkers that are highlighted here. Um, but to, to uh, really uh, understand how, how to um, uh, interrogate and analyze sweat, we sort of have to look at the, 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 the past and what, what has been done over the past several decades are a number of different um, studies that have looked at 
uh, sweat biomarkers in the context of more laboratory settings. Um, uh, there's a number of uh, benchtop tools that have looked at various biomarkers, such as chloride for cystic fibrosis testing, as I'll go into in a little bit, as well as mass spec and liquid, liquid chromatography systems that really start to tease apart uh, the various biomarkers in sweat. But there's a number of key challenges that really limit the utility of these types of laboratory-based systems. Um, and it's just impossible to be able to deploy these in a more remote or at-home uh, environmental setting. And uh, that's really where uh, we took a step back uh, about six, seven years ago as a group and started to look at ways where we could take the existing laboratory settings and be able to transfer them over to more miniaturized systems. And our inspiration to start was uh, to look at microfluidic technologies. Um, uh, Professor George Whitesides was a speaker um, in this seminar series earlier. Um, I worked with him uh, as well as uh, later on with Professor John Rogers. And having that background really helped me and um, the team at Northwestern figure out ways that we could maybe take what you see here and build them into flexible, more uh, curvilinear structures that could be worn on the skin in a wearable format. And uh, to do that, though, we first took a look at the existing systems, although very powerful for cell sorting, as well as various other uh, analyses uh, uh, types with DNA, RNA, um, and, and others. Uh, these systems tend to be fairly rigid and planar once you uh, bond the PDMS to a glass slide and create the microfluidic channels. Uh, they also rely on a number of different uh, external uh, types of instrumentation, such as uh, the various syringe pumps and uh, tubings that you need to really uh, uh, drive the, uh, the 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 classes of microfluidic systems that are out there in the point of care setting. And uh, we realized that that would be very difficult to do um, uh, with uh, an on-body, uh, untethered type of device. And so what we decided was let's figure out a system that could be worn on the body uh, and used in a way that could really just harness the, the body, the crying sweat gland in particular, in a way to drive sweat into the device without needing valves or battery or any type of actuators. And uh, this was a system that Professor John Rogers, myself and the broader team published back in 2016. Um, around a, a new type of device that has microfluidic uh, uh, structures built in along with flexible electronics, colorimetric uh, assays, as well as maybe electrochemical sensors all built into a device of this size. Uh, this is about the size of a, of a quarter uh, on the skin and it's all completely uh, detached from any external power or uh, various other types of tools that you would need. And um, this was really the starting point for us. Uh, it led to a whole different class of devices. I'm going to show a video that shows exactly how you could get flow of sweat into the various micro channels. And this specific uh, square device is um, on uh, a platform here. It's hooked up to two uh, 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 outlets where... Um, uh, just colored dye is uh, flown in. And you could see in blue and also in red, the various channels are filling in a multiplex type of mode, uh, where the idea is we can potentially measure sweat dynamics as well as various different biomarkers that could be um, uh, positioned and uh, pre-embedded into these different circular assay wells that you see. And in total, this allows us to do a number of things on your skin without necessarily needing any type of laboratory-based equipment. Uh, notice here, a lot of the capabilities that I've highlighted are all based on color metric uh, assays. Um, and that's what I'll start with. Uh, there's, it turns out, you know, simplicity wins. Um, that's something that uh, Professor George Whitesides and others have really pushed and across the, the, the biomedical sphere. Um, we decided, well, let's see how, how well we could do with color metric assays, tuning them to the precise geometry and the 
device structures that we have. And you can see four different bioassays, uh, some based on chemical reagents, others based on ELISA-based chemistries, and all of which need to be validated in the context of this new type of device, this wearable system, um, and being able to really get it to that translational um, next stage, you got to do various things around validation, but also shelf storage, accelerated aging, uh, all of those things. But we we decided that, you know, this is a really interesting place to start. And you could see some pretty strong correlations with uh, various uh, concentration levels um, and, and the color intensities shown in, in this slide. Uh, the other aspect of, of this type of device was really around figuring out the design guide for the microfluidic channels, um, whether we go with a hydrophilic versus a hydrophobic structure. Uh, and it turns out to do uh, sweat dynamic measurements, we decided that we want to go hydrophobic so that you could push sweat in driven by the pressure gradients by the eccrine sweat glands as opposed to capillary action forces. Um, and uh, really what's highlighted here is a few finite element simulations that showcase um, what is possible at different length scales. Uh, and here I'm highlighting the width of the channel going from about 10 microns up to about 120 microns. And you could see that there's a bursting pressure that's required to really uh, have fluid uh, enter into some of these channels. And at very small dimensions, it's really tough to overcome that, but there's a sweet spot. And we know that uh, the pressure gradient uh, correlating to those dimensions um, to be able to get uh, sweat to flow into the, into the micro channels. And we were able to do that. And others have also looked at um, uh, uh, ways of quantifying these pressure gradients. And it turns out a paper out, uh, from 1969 did a fairly elegant study looking at uh, uh, micropipettes that are just shallow um, presented onto the surface of the epidermis, looking at specific um, uh, sweat flow through a, a single micropore uh, in your skin. And uh, so that was characterized at the level of about 72 kilopascals, and you could sort of aggregate those across hundreds, if not thousands of, of skin pores that you may want to interrogate or collect sweat across. Uh, so we, we've done that and uh, we built out a, a, a class of various systems that um, are starting to uh, be deployed uh, both clinically, but also commercially now. And this is just one example of a device that was deployed uh, and built out such that you could measure uh, and capture and measure sweat um, underwater. Um, this deployed with a swimming team at Northwestern where we were able to show that you do in fact sweat uh, when you're swimming and we're able to capture that tiny micro uh, liter quantities of sweat and be able to measure uh, its chemical properties, but also have various other electronic components that could tell us about your skin temperature in that local micro environment at the same time. Um, why are we doing this? Well, it turns out that there's a real need. And once we published our first paper um, around the technology, we found out quickly that uh, there's a lot of interest in the hydration monitoring space, specifically looking at per personalized hydration uh, techniques. And then uh, there's also interest in looking at various other biomarkers, metabolites, cortisol on the hormone spectrum, and looking at malnutrition, stress, and other uh, aspects that really tie into more health-related applications. Um, and so there, there's a, a real need in uh, sports and consumer health, maybe even healthcare-based applications. Uh, but uh, we also took a deeper look at what's happening in the world with climate change and various aspects of just industrial work and what uh, various um, uh, different uh people face on a daily basis uh, uh, doing their regular jobs. And given the uh, the calamity that we're seeing now with uh, extreme heat waves, uh, this is a global phenomenon and it really highlights the need to be able to monitor at a personalized level your hydration, your micronutrients to be able to provide feedback so that you could um, intervene and 
preventatively uh, avoid certain heat stress, dehydration, malnutrition risks. Um, there's a lot of data here. I, I won't go too far into it, but uh, just the fact that um, we're seeing these um, uh, cases happen year in, year out now, and there's just a lot of significant costs as well as uh, uh, burden on um, workers. Uh, we've really focused in and look, look at the literature in this regard. So uh, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and talk about specifically what are we doing um, and how are we uh, taking that next big step from uh, research studies, new devices, new designs to taking it to that next level of translation and commercialization, which is work that we're doing at Epicor. And uh, over the past three, four years, we've spent a lot of time uh, doing that work, validation, as well as scale up and getting uh, commercialized products out into the market. And the first product that really uh, exploits this technology, taking uh, these micro channels and building bioassays integrated in, coupling it together with algorithms on a mobile app uh, is what's shown here, the GX sweat patch. And it's all about um, sports hydration applications. Um, uh, the device uh, works, as I mentioned, with an app. Uh, the way um, uh, the, the system functions is you have two micro channels, uh, one that fills with this uh, sweat that mixes with an orange dye. Um, and the second is an assay that's underneath the graphics layer here that contains um, reagents that uh, bind with chloride um, molecules um, and ions in, in, in the um in the sweat and the purple color intensity corresponds to the concentration of uh, chloride as well as sodium uh, found in sweat. Uh, as soon as you put on the device uh, and go exercise, sweat starts to trickle in and propagate through these two channels um, in parallel. And once you take a break or at the end of an event, you can scan the patch and uh, the uh, image processing algorithms uh, are able to determine the extent of flow as well as uh, the color changes that correspond to the concentration of sodium chloride. Uh, so we've done that and we've spent a lot of time in partnership with companies like Gatorade and uh, Chevron and other companies out there uh, worked on um, really bringing this technology and others to, to the forefront. And uh, working with a company like Gatorade and PepsiCo uh, gives us a lot of uh, uh, um, exposure to various athletes. Uh, Lionel Messi, Serena Williams, and uh, shown here, Jason Tatum are some of the athletes that have worn and really pushed the technology forward. Uh, this is all brand new. Uh, you know, it's not step counting, heart rate. We're uh, in a way bringing technology out, publishing it, launching products, and then really educating people on where uh, they could really deploy these types of solutions in their everyday lives. So, We've done that and uh, we've also published the work. Uh, so this was a validation paper that published in Science Advances right before the paper, right before the product came out and uh, highlighting uh, in a blinded study versus uh, the absorbent pads that I mentioned earlier um, across 312 subjects, how our device does compare to the gold standard. And you could see across the ion detection, as well as the sweat rate or dynamics, we get pretty good correlation across um, compared to the uh, the gold standard on the y-axis shown in the two plots. Um, that is really core to our DNA, to what we do both at the university level, but also when you spin out a company and really get things out there. Uh, in some cases, startups have to be pretty stealthy in getting technology out and um, you know, really getting your product commercialized takes a lot of work and you got to file patents. But what we do in parallel with that is really get the validation work out to show that uh, it's been tested against the gold standards and uh, really provides that clinical rigor to be able to get the work out there. It's more time consuming to do that. It's more expensive if you're a small company to do that, but it's well worth the long term. Um, uh, getting that validation piece in order. Um, so uh, that that that's a very um, sports consumer health driven application. I'm going to focus now on uh, more um, 
medical related application using the same class of devices, the same wearable microfluidics with color metric capabilities. And uh, an area in particular that we've looked at in collaboration with the Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago uh, has to do with cystic fibrosis and specifically uh, building our epifluidic systems to uh, address the uh, the issues and the the limitations of the existing macro duct uh, based devices that are out in the market used to collect sweat and um, uh, used to extract out that sweat and run analyses on it. Well, we've done studies now uh, over uh, at this point. Um, we've published uh, this study where we had about fifty one participants. Now we're over a hundred. Um, and uh, really, the idea was to place these devices on patients uh, as young as young as neonates, but even adults, and show that the device goes head to head against the gold standard again as part of our feasibility and clinical validation work. And what we found is that in measuring sweat chloride levels, um, uh, we do pretty well compared to. Uh, the gold standard on, on the x-axis here. Um, the chloride measurements uh, are looking pretty good, and um, really the benefit over the um, the macro duct is the form factor. Building a device that's soft, flexible, uh, much lower modulus than you would expect with a injection molded plastic type device. Um, that advantage on the mechanics leads to better comfort and um, quality of life for the for the patients as well as the parents in some cases uh, for these types of uh, uh, debilitating diseases. And so we've done that. We published the work um, uh, about a year and a half ago now, uh, highlighting uh, the gold standard measurements versus our new uh, epifluidic devices. And um, we're continuing work now under an NIH grant looking at adults who are uh, using these classes of devices to manage their therapeutic um, intakes. Um, there's a lot of really powerful drugs that are doing really well uh, in helping patients live with cystic fibrosis um, uh, as opposed to really having a, a poor quality of life and in some cases shorten lifespans. Uh, but really the, the need now is to be able to build management tools to see how dosing works, how how well patients are uh, uh, adhering and whether or not um, there's certain changes. And one way to do that we found is to look at sweat chloride concentrations. Are they dropping with the therapeutic um, interventions? And uh, a lot of really interesting work happening there. Um, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about our connected hydration platform. And in contrast to what I've shared thus far, where um, we've mostly done colorimetric assays. The system here is completely uh, enabled with uh, Bluetooth, battery, memory, electrochemical sensors all built in. And the idea is uh, by building such a system, we could do continuous monitoring of various biomarkers. And I mentioned the sweat biomarkers, uh, sweat rate, sodium chloride, based on a conductivity measurement. But we also have on board this device shown on the on the uh, upper brachialis region of the arm. Uh, we can also measure skin temperature, um, differentials even to measure thermal flux. Uh, we have an accelerometer on board uh, that can measure your motion and activity. Uh, there is also a vibratory haptics motor that can measure your sweat losses and provide you uh, uh, haptic feedback as to whether or not you've passed a, th a certain threshold in terms of your uh, fluid loss per your body weight. And all of that uh, is shown at representative here uh, where we're measuring over time certain peaks and valleys that, that could occur in your sodium chloride as well as your overall volume loss of fluid as well as your sweat rate. Uh, turns out there's really interesting insights if you look at these biochemical sensing capabilities and, and data streams compared to skin temperature and your motion and heart rate and various other things. So really interesting uh, opportunities there to really expand out uh, the capabilities. And, um, you know, ways of converging, well, you know, building a new device that collects various new uh, biochemical markers and 
converging those with what exists out there in the real world today uh, presents some interesting opportunities, as I mentioned, where you could look at heart rate, blood pressure, uh, gait, speed, uh, and then uh, really start to correlate those with um, the various biochemical sensing capabilities. Uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities there. Um, and where uh, we really see the world going um, in, in this last part is um, uh, not just convergence of sensors, but really bringing all of these capabilities together uh, such that you can um, predict various dehydration episodes or stress um, using not just the uh, the biophysical metrics, but also the uh, the biochemical. And uh, we've leveraged a lot of the, the great work that's been done in continuous glucose monitoring for uh, interstitial fluid targets to really look at sweat as a new uh, new new biofluid target. And um, you know really where things go from here is more remote deployments as well as um, uh, deployments in the home for patients. Um, in the last minute here, I'm just going to bring it back high level for a sec, uh, given that uh, this is a, a talk that touches on both translation and uh, research at the academic level. Uh, and, you know, the seminar series certainly embodies that. Um, this is a, a, a startup development cycle uh, uh, visual that uh, has been out there. Um, uh, a lot of uh, different groups in academia, military, as well as uh, investment groups look at this. And uh, uh, what it highlights is a lot of the great work that happens in academia upstream, and then industry sort of takes over uh, when it comes to, you know, system level prototypes and scale up and deployments and really digging into the market and, you know, even the, I would say the regulatory aspects of what needs to get done. There's a lot of work there. And um, what's shown in the middle is the valley of death where, you know, a lot of technologies really don't make it out um, and, and grow to, you know, the industry level. And it's because there's a lot of um, needs around funding, around uh, support. And I, I think uh, various schools like Stanford, Northwestern, MIT, Berkeley, various uh, number of schools across the world even are, are trying to bridge that gap. Um, and one thing uh, that I would just highlight is um, it doesn't have to be a one-way road. There is a feedback loop that uh, I think we've uh, certainly uh, benefited from and um, really embraced at Epicor and other companies that we've spun out. And it's really being able to leverage the funding that comes here from the foundations and the government groups um, and uh, looking at some of the investors and groups that look at things further downstream. And, uh, you know, publishing papers doesn't just have to be an uh, exercise in academia. There's a lot of validation work that we found really helps. Um, and, um, you know, really starting the clock on investments later on and being able to build out the capabilities also helps uh, bridge that gap. So uh, I'd like to leave it uh, there. Um, uh, one last just acknowledgement, a lot of the work I, I just mentioned stems from research uh, out at Northwestern at the Corey Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics and uh, Epicor is certainly one of a, a few companies that we've spun out from, from that lab. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.